morning, everyone. Uh, so this will be one of the last lessons in our bonding chapter. Uh, yesterday we had a look at polarity. Uh, we had a look at how polarity influences what are called intermolecular forces, the in-between forces. Uh, we used melting point and boiling point as a way to gauge uh, how strong the melting point and boiling point were. Uh, essentially, the hotter the temperature, it means the molecules or the particles, they attract each other uh, more strongly, and therefore you need hotter temperatures to therefore melt. So uh, we're going to do a quick warm-up question based on that stuff there. And then today we're just going to deal with a few miscellaneous cases. We'll have another look at metallic bonding, just make sure we're uh, clear on uh, what uh, how metals bond to each uh, other, as well as some of their properties, and as well we'll end off with uh, what are called allotropes. We're going to look specifically at carbon type of allotropes here, uh, basically the different formations that carbon can have uh, in the in the physical uh, state. So uh, let's start off with that warm-up question and we'll go from there. So to begin here, uh, just as a practice, Usually the questions on intermolecular forces ask you to arrange or order something either by increasing or decreasing. Let's do decreasing this time. Arrange by decreasing, let's say, melting point. So I'm going to give you a few molecules here. Uh, let's do so it's five carbons in a row. Uh, I will do an organic uh, intro for you in the next uh, lesson. Uh, we'll have and then and then we'll have one that's uh, structured a little bit differently. Uh, ch 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 and then the other, these are going to be called methyl groups. They're, they're attached off the center, right? So they give you just three random molecules here. Uh, when we actually get to doing a lot of organic stuff, uh, this stuff here will be really easy to draw. But for the time being, uh, pretty much in most organic molecules, you expect the carbons to be bonded uh, to each other. Uh, even though the H's seemingly come afterwards, uh, we know H's have to be terminal. H's can only handle two electrons. They can't actually handle two bonds. Uh, first thing, surprisingly, what we do is we try to find the molar mass of these guys here. Uh, remember, the molar mass is an indication of how many um, attachments that I have. Uh, and based on that, uh, it's going to uh, have an impact on how many, how much charges I have and the line of force that I have. So uh, molar mass of this guy here is 72. Uh, the other guy is an isomer, so that's also 72. Uh, the molar masses don't have to be exactly the same. Let's do for four carbons, four times 12, plus 10 hydrogens, plus the 16 of oxygen. This one here is 74. doesn't have to be identical, but it should be roughly the same. If you're finding one of these molecules has like some 2,000 molar mass or something, even if they have really those weak London forces, just the sheer number of charges would actually uh, come into play. So it's not a fair comparison. So in this case here, the molar masses are fairly similar. Uh, we can sort of conclude based on that there, pretty much uh, they should have similar London forces. So in terms of the background attractions that we can never get rid of, whether we're polar or nonpolar, at least that part there is fixed. Now what we do, like we did in the last lesson, is we look inside the structure. Let's decide whether we're polar or nonpolar. Depending on that answer, if we're nonpolar, we just have the London forces that I just talked about. And if we're polar, we may be either dipole-dipole or it might be hydrogen bonding. Uh, we did it in order last day. London forces are easiest to melt, and then we have the dipole-dipole, and then we have finally the uh, hydrogen bonding. In this case here, we have an alkane. So basically, I have uh, five carbons in a row. They're all single bonded. Uh, the name we're going to see comes from the carbon parts of it, uh, but we just assume that the rest of it is saturated with hydrogen. So there's a bunch of H's. We call this a hydrocarbon because there's only C's and H's. And in this case here, if I investigate each bond separately, although the carbon does win by a smidgen, just by a little bit, uh, we usually say that difference of 0.4 is so tiny, this guy practically inside is nonpolar. Same thing happens to this guy here on the right-hand side here. Again, just mainly C and H bonds here. This guy internally, again, is nonpolar. So both of these ones here are nonpolar, meaning they only have the very weak London forces. Remember, to show a London force, I need to at least have drawn two of these molecules, and the London forces are the attractions between all the protons and the electrons on the neighbors. There will be some inevitable background attractions uh, along the chain here. Uh, same thing here. Uh, we talked about there being temporary dipoles. When electrons swish and swash, we can create temporary or instantaneous dipoles. Uh, they can cause, they can induce dipoles in other uh, molecules. Uh, in that case, it could give an extra mechanism for these London forces. Let's take another look at this middle guy as well. So we do have the CH3, CH2. Um, drawing these H's here. We have the O, CH3, oh, sorry, CH2, CH3. At first, when you look at this one here, again, we're not worried about the C and H part. Uh, 
At first, you might say, okay, O is more electronegative, that bond is polar. O is electronegative, that bond is polar. You might worry, oh, because my geometry were linear, we're going to cancel out. In this case here, this would be analogous to water. Even though water was seemingly looking like this, although Lewis doesn't care the geometry, this is actually a little bit misleading. Our real diagram actually doesn't have this 180 degrees. If I truly were being pushed exactly left and exactly right, certainly they would cancel. But you'll notice this oxygen here actually does have lone pairs. It actually has four lone pairs, meaning it's actually based off a tetrahedral. In fact, this whole structure, even though it's looked like a um, you know, cement roller has sort of flattened this thing out, in fact, this the whole chain here is tetrahedral, tetrahedral, tetrahedral. It's actually best to show it to you zigzag. We'll see that a little more in the next lesson. So in this case here, when the oxygen wins and the oxygen wins, sure, there's going to be a little bit of the vector that actually cancels out, but you notice both of them point towards oxygen. That's the relatively negative side. This is partially negative. This is partially positive. And that there yesterday we called a permanent dipole. It's a permanent separation of charge. In this case here, we then, is it dipole-dipole or is it hydrogen bonding? In this case here, although there are H's and there's an O, it's not H directly connected to either an N or an F. It's just C fighting against O. C doesn't lose as badly. Off the top of my head, I think the difference is 0.8. So therefore, this is just internally, it's a polar compound. So therefore, when I have two of these molecules here, if I look at the dipole in this compound, and I look at the dipole whichever way it's in another compound here, the dipole-dipole force, again, is the intermolecular force. It's the negative is attracted to the permanent positive. The negative is attracted to the permanent positive. So it's these in the highlight that we're calling dipole-dipole. Uh, again, try not to give me a certain number of dipole-dipole. Uh, you just say it has access to dipole-dipole forces. So in this case here, we want decreasing melting point. So we want the thing that's hardest to melt first. In this case here, dipole-dipole is strongest. So I'm going to take this molecule here. Let's label them A, B, and C. In this case here, B, I would expect to be the ha uh, hardest to melt. That one here would need the biggest temperature. Between the other two, it's a little bit more of a toss-up. All these guys here are nonpolar. They have exactly the same molar mass. They have the same London forces. I mentioned the term that they're actually isomers of each other. They actually have the same uh, number of C's and H's. In pretty much every way, they're identical, with the exception that in this case, the first one is a long straight chain. So it's five carbons in a row, whereas this one acts more like a soccer ball, where th the middle carbon here is sort of hidden away, and the other carbons are sort of uh, around on either side. If you had to guess, I know it's not going to be by much, but if you had to guess, if I had a nice long chain doing London forces or if I had soccer ball doing London forces, which one would you expect the London forces to be greater? In this case here, I would argue, if you check the melting point as well, because in a long chain, we can actually London force all along the chain, there's going to be a lot more interactions when we geometrically actually look kind of condensed on ourselves into this sort of ball shape. The amount of London forces here that we can access, sort of like that middle carbon here is sort of hidden away, those carbons won't be able to get as close to each other. I would argue that this one here has less London forces, weaker London forces than an A. So if I were to guess here, again, this is all just a prediction. You can actually go and actually look up these molecules and see whether that's the case or not. So hopefully that clears up a little bit of uh, intermolecular force stuff here. Really, they're just going to ask you in terms of, well, define it in terms of melting point, boiling point, who's high, who's low, uh, why is it harder to melt, why is it easier to boil. All right, so uh, today, as I mentioned, we're going to take a look at two last uh, sort of miscellaneous cases. We're just called these special cases of bonding. Uh, we had touched on these uh, in an earlier lesson, but let's just uh, go through them again. Uh, first type of force here we're going to refer to as metallic bonding. We first saw this in periodicity when we started looking at melting point trends. Again, we're looking at internal forces that are actually uh, keeping the thing together. Say someone here hands you a block of lithium. So lithium is made out of lithium atoms, lithium, 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 lithium. If you look at the Bohr model for lithium, every single lithium should have two shells. It has one valence electron. In this case, in the case of metallic bonding, it's perfectly happy having that one valence electron. It's only when things try to bond, that's when they want to satisfy the octet. So in this case here, every single lithium on average has three electrons, one in the valence shell. This is very similar to ionic, but the main difference is there are no anions. There's no uh, non-metals, there's no actual negative charges. So when we talk about a metallic bond and we talk about like where is the Coulomb attraction, the KQQ bar squared, we need to identify for us who is the positive and who is the negative. In this case here, just before I rewrite the definition, um, let's uh, take a look at our periodic table. In general, we have our metals on the left-hand side here. We know based on our periodicity chapter, our metals tend to have the biggest radius. Metals tend 
to have the biggest radius. And I'm just going to specify here on their period. So on every row, they tend to have the biggest radius. You should be able to quote for me from chapter 3. That's because I have a relatively low Z effective. And in that case there, because I'm a fairly large atom, larger atoms tend not to hang on to their electrons really well. We're going to see the combination. This means it's going to be pretty easy to ionize, low ionization energy. I wrote this a couple times now. It's really easy to remove an electron. And also being so large, if I have an electron that's sort of loose like this, that electron doesn't really want to get regained. Uh, the metal can't really stabilize it, let alone the metal doesn't really want a negative charge. So low ionization energy, also low in terms of electron activity. If I wanted to tug a war, in this case here, because I would have completely lost the electron, I'm more focusing on electron affinity. Uh, how much stability do I get for regaining that electron? So in that case there, I always say electrons are unloved. Even though every lithium on average should have three valence electrons, you give these electrons a bump, and this electron has completely been dislodged. In fact, all these electrons are completely dislodged. They're welcome to swim through the entire structure, although the solid nuclei themselves are sort of stuck in place. In the solid, they're just vibrating. Because of this property being a very large atom, uh, they tend to uh, not hold their electrons very well. So in that case there, uh, we can quote metallic bonding here. We are talking about a Coulomb attraction or an electrostatic attraction. Electrostatic has to do with forces between charges. So electrostatic attraction... Who is the positive this time? So between this time, as I showed you, it's the positive nuclei. I picture them as sort of being stapled down. They're just shaking in place. Normally, it would just be the positive liking its own electrons, but this positive here actually will like the electrons as those electrons actually swim past it. We know sort of in hindsight, the metals tend to be solids, so we know metallic bonding here in general is going to be strong. So electrostatic attraction between positive nuclei, the wording we're going to use is N delocalized electrons. It's not really easy for you to point your finger at where is the electron because the electrons are completely uh, swimming around here. They refer to these electrons here as the electron C model. So imagine a whole pool or an ocean of electrons. The ocean can swim to one side, swim to the other side. We do have charges that can move, so therefore uh, we have it uh, being conducted. So that's our electron C model here. That's what metallic bonding is. We d identify the positive and the negative. And then we can say, well, since we are in electrostatic attraction, we've been saying for a long time, Coulomb is KQQ of R squared. If you want the metallic bonding to be stronger, say I want the force to be stronger, you either want the charges to be bigger or you want the radii to be smaller. Which is why back in chapter 3, as I know what happens to the radius going across here, as the ZFF increases, as that radius shrinks, I'm also going to pick up more protons. The force of attraction between the leftover atoms will be better. It's going to be generally harder to mount going to the right and also going upwards because I'm losing shells. I'm also getting tinier. Even though Z effector doesn't really change, the uh, lesser shells would imply a stronger force. So based on this one here, you don't need to memorize that. You always have Coulomb's force here. We have stronger bonding, so stronger metallic forces. If we have basically higher charges here. So in this case here, we might be thinking more protons. If we really were charged, it could be in the terms of oxidation state, positive one, positive two. But in this case here, we're just neutral anyway. And in this case here, smaller radius. The smaller radius means the charges are closer together. And when they're uh, closer together, they're going to attract uh, better. Um, I also mentioned this delocalized electrons. We saw delocalized electrons in an earlier lesson as well. Hopefully you were able to remember it was based on the resonance section. Resonance was when the double bond could have been on one side or on the other side. The electrons are actually shared over multiple centers. That was our other case of delocalization. Because of this delocalization, I have charges that can move. Let me just circle this here. Because I have charges uh, mobile through, I'm going to call it the bulk sample. So they're not just sort of... Um, uh, orbiting just a single atom because the electrons are free to roam around the entire picture here. If I put a positive one side and a negative one side, it can actually carry a current. It can give these electrons uh, some uh, motion. So through the bulk sample, and therefore we have it being electrically conducted. In fact, as we get into the next uh, little bit on metallic bonding as well, we're going to learn that zooming in so closely at the atoms, if I know something about how things are actually attached together, it actually gives rise to some macroscopic properties. Like, for example, because electrons are free to roam around, I can predict that the bulk sample would be conductive.
Uh, similar to biology, when we look at organelles, we look at the different structures, we look at how things are shaped, uh, whether they're double-walled or single-walled, things like that, and based on the structure, we try to imply the function, sort of essentially the same as in chemistry, although we're looking a lot more um, zoomed in, uh, because those organelles will be made out of uh, many, many particles, and if I know how the particles themselves interact together, uh, we know uh, the macroscopic property. Uh, one other link like that here is we say metals. Uh, one property is metals tend to be malleable. So if you take a mallet to it, if you take a hammer to it, it flattens out into nice sheets. It doesn't crack or shatter on you here. Or uh, ductile is another word here. Ductile means stretches out into wires. It doesn't crack, it doesn't shatter. Again, can we predict this uh, based on um, the sort of the zoomed in, what are the particles actually doing to actually imply the macroscopic trend? So in this case here, we had this sort of metal, metal, metal. So I'm going to just sort of draw a bunch of metal centers here. Remember, in metallic bonding here, we only have metals. We already said the electrons are actually delocalized. Electrons are actually swimming around. So you'll notice in comparison to, let's say, the ionic model. Let's compare it here. So in the ionic case here, sure, I might still have my metal, but they're sort of interspersed with nonmetals. They're interspersed with positive, negative, positive, negative. In this case here, in both of them, it is a Coulomb attraction. In the metal case, it's the positive centers attracting their neighboring electrons. Who knows where they are? They're just in this pool of electrons. Whereas in the ionic case, every single metal has now lost the electron. It's now a full positive. The other one is going to be a full negative. And in this case here, what's happening here is when we talk about an ionic bond earlier in the chapter, we said an ionic bond is physically this positive has a neighbor. It wants to counterbalance the charges so the charges can cancel. But in some sense here, Unlike a covalent bond, it doesn't really form a stick, but really this positive really wants to be close exactly to this negative. Sure, it is attracted to a really far away negative as well. There are still some other background attractions, but the strongest attraction will be for the one that's closest to it. So if you imagine there are actually ionic bonds that are holding these sort of neighbors together, and we also know that they form a lattice structure here. If you take a hammer to this picture here, the hammer will forcefully try to hammer some of these top layers and try to squeeze these layers here down into the bottom layers. In that case there, you're actually trying to separate this positive wanted to hold onto this exact negative. The hammer actually physically needs to break up this bond here. Maybe not enough to actually melt it because you're just taking a hammer to it. You're just trying to flatten it out. But in that case there, we are physically having to break up a bond. And in that case, the layers will resist you. It won't really slide really easily. Compare that to the metallic bonding case here. Again, the difference here is there are no nonmetals around. Because the electrons are already loose, we refer to this type of bonding here as non-directional bonding. Unlike the ionic case, non-directional bonding. Unlike the ionic case, this, let's say this atom here on the top left, has no particular affinity to just the neighboring atom because if you look at where the bonds are, it would have been attracted to any electrons that happen to swim around it. So there really are no physical bonds that I'm trying to hammer and break off and whatnot. You take a hammer to the metals, the metals say, fine. Uh, you're not having to break any bonds anyways. I was attracted to electrons that are swimming around me, and I can very easily, relatively speaking, I can very easily take a hammer, and I can slide this top layer here easily into the bottom layer. It also helps if metals have the same radius, so they really easily slide into each other. So in that case there, we have one layer sliding into the other, and we end up having like those eight electrons perhaps on exactly the same um, the same uh, floor, the same row here. And in this case here, the electrons haven't really cared. The electrons used to be swimming around the entire sample anyway. The electrons are still swimming around. It's like being able to slide the layers into each other without actually breaking any bonds. So make a note to yourself your non-directional bonding. Um, again, make a note layers, slide, or you can even use the terminology of stretching as well. If instead of taking a hammer, I pull at it from both ends, I pull at it a little bit to the right and a little bit to the left, these layers here will nicely foil into each other without actually breaking uh, any bonds. So layers slide or let's say stretch into each other. And the key here is without breaking bonds. And that's because, again, the bonds themselves weren't any affinity to exactly any two centers because the bonding was between the electrons that were free to roam around anyways. As you start hammering the layers together, the electrons are still free to roam around, although now because the nuclei are now in one layer, the electrons are less space to swim around. Again, if we can somehow tell the structure, we can somehow tell the function.
Uh, metals, we know another property is they're definitely uh, low solubility. So you drop them in water, they don't really dissolve well. However, for metals, you can heat up a metal. You can liquefy a metal, let's say at I don't know, some 700, 800 degrees or so, maybe even hotter than that. And what you can do is you can actually melt solid metals and non-metals into each other. So they do want you to know this terminology here. We can make what are called alloys. Alloys here are homogeneous mixtures. Homogeneous means they feel like one material. Uh, homogeneous mixtures of metals, and we're going to throw in the odd non-metal as well. So basically, I'm taking one metal, and I'm melting one metal into the other metal. Some examples we see is we have steel. Steel comes in many different grades depending on uh, what properties you want, but the primary components of steel, not the only ones. Uh, primary, we have iron for the strong, the strength of the uh, steel, and then we have carbon, adds a little bit of flexibility. I know carbon is a non-metal, but if I then melt these two into each other, we can get many different uh, grades of steel depending on what it uses. Uh, brass, like for a lot of our musical instruments as well, brass is primarily made out of copper and zinc. And basically what's happening here is I'm heating one metal up really, really hot, taking the other metal and dropping it in. There's a field of chemistry called metallic chemistry or metallurgy. And basically what they do here is they actually play around with which is the one that I liquefy, what, uh, how do I drop the other metal in, do I drop it in as a solid, do I do a rapid cooling, so basically do I cool it down all at once so the atoms themselves, once they're mixed, they get locked in place, or do I allow it to do slow cooling and let the particles naturally form a certain structure. Um, so there's a lot of uh, interesting chemistry that you can do uh, with metal chemistry. Uh, one thing we're going to learn, however, is because we're now going to be a mixture of many different, uh, mainly going to be metals, but again, the odd non-metal, we're going to be a mixture where some of the atoms are going to be large, some of the atoms are going to be tiny, some of them are going to be a little tinier as well. Again, I'm, not, I'm noting here the positive centers of all these. We know as metals, even the alloys themselves should be conductive. Metals generally are going to be the largest across the rows. But if you imagine back to that trend of malleable and ductility, we wanted the layers to slide into each other. If you take a hammer to this, sure, something that's small might be able to weave into the bottom layer, but something that's big might have a little bit harder chance. So in general here, we say alloys tend to be more stiff. Again, if I can sort of predict the layers aren't really easy to uh, fall into each other here, we would expect because they're more stiff, they're actually less malleable and less ductile. So keep in mind, again, metallic bonding here, generally it's the larger atoms across the row. Generally, we have this delocalized nature. Uh, because the electrons are swimming around, there is non-directional bonding, and then we can predict why it's uh, layers sliding into each other, uh, malleable, ductile, as well as conductive. So that, treat that as just a sort of special bonding case here. We'll end up this lesson here looking at another special case here, and we'll look at, in general, uh, things that form what's called a covalent network. Again, we were introduced to these uh, covalent network, or you can call it a giant, uh, giant molecule. Uh, in this case here, they actually have the best of both worlds. We saw this back in periodicity. Uh, so this is covalent bonding. Dollar for dollar, a covalent bond is actually stronger than an ionic bond. However, when we look at covalent molecules, they tend to be individual molecules. If I try to melt them, I'm not trying to break the covalent bond. I'm just trying to break the in-between forces. So it's actually not a fair comparison. Oh, uh, I see that the non-metals of covalents are actually gaseous. They actually really internally still have really strong covalent bonds. The only forces I overcame to melt it and boil it was actually just those weak London forces we saw yesterday. So covalent bonds are the stronger ones here. Covalent bonds typically keep to themselves, but in this case here, we have a few uh, elements that actually imply this uh, giant structure. Typically, it's the metalloids that actually uh, demonstrate this. I'm going to introduce you to a word here that are going to be called allotropes. Uh, many different elements show allotropes, but we're just going to use carbon as an example. An allotrope here, it's on the same level as like an isotope or an ion. Isotopes, something is the same about them, but something is also different. In the case of isotopes, it was different mass. In this case here, we're talking the same element. So same as isotopes, we have the same proton number. We even have the same state, right? So if we're looking at the solid state, uh, this form is solid, this form is solid. That's why we use the terminology of phase instead. You can be in phase number one, phase number two, even though state-wise it's all solid. But what's different here is they actually have a different structure or they have a different bonding. So allotropes is a general word. We're going to do the example and only this example. We'll take a look at a few different formations for carbon.
So as you go through these uh, different states here, it is just going to be pure carbon. It's carbon, 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 carbon. There's no other elements involved. However, the difference in the formation is how the carbons are actually being attached. Uh, it's fair game for them to ask the question of, can you state some of the most common allotropes of carbon here? Uh, I'm going to state for you uh, three main ones for you. Uh, first form, diamond takes here, is diamond, uh, carbon can actually be diamond. Right? So really, really precious um, uh, non-metal here, really, really used for a lot of jewelry, things like that. If you actually use a powerful enough microscope, you can actually see how diamond is actually bonded together. We have each carbon is tetrahedrally, so in a tetrahedral formation, tetrahedrally bonded, and when you bond tetrahedrally, you're bonded to four other carbons, uh, to four others. What's the hybridization that you need for tetrahedral? Hopefully you're able to say to me sp3. So I want you to imagine here taking a carbon, it's tetrahedrally bonded, meaning I have carbon, I'm going to draw as many bonds as I can that's on the plane, because we are in 3D, it's going to be a little bit harder to you know, use those wedges and dashes again. Carbon has bonded to itself. You notice it's just plain old carbon, but each of these carbons themselves are also tetrahedrally bonded. This is going to get really complicated really, really fast. And basically, I have the best of both worlds. I have the strength of a covalent bond. Covalent bonds are nice. Um, but I have the lattice structure that I would expect for an ionic compound, and this just repeats uh, endlessly. So if you try to melt this guy, or if you try to even uh, hammer and break this guy here, you're not only having to break one bond, just like an ionic bond, you're actually having to break a ton of bonds. And you notice, unlike ionic compounds, which typically form nice lattice structures where they don't have to perfectly be one on top of the other, but there's a nice, what's called a cleaving plane. There's a nice sort of uh, flat uh, sheet that I can cut along. Whereas in this case here, the bond angle for tetrahedral, we had said it's 109.5. Uh, all the angles are just kinked every which way. There's no nice cleaving plane here. There's no nice one surface I can just cut along. I actually need to cut along multiple surfaces. That also adds to it being really, really hard to uh, melt. So in this case here, we know the structure. So you can quote, carbon is tetrahedrally bonded. This one here has a very high melting point boiling point. I don't know why you'd want to melt diamond, but theoretically you can. And in this case here, it actually makes diamond the hardest natural mineral that I can find. In fact, a lot of uh, construction workers will use diamond for their drill bits. If the diamond drill bit is harder than whatever they're digging into, the diamond will dig a hole uh, into the ground or whatever uh, material you're digging. Um, because we've been able to play around with the chemistry, we've been able to synthetically sort of mimic diamond and we've created other things that are harder than it, but at least it's the hardest natural mineral. When you dig it out of the earth under high pressures, high temperatures as well, it's not shiny. Jewelers will actually need to do a lot of uh, work on it to try to get it to reflect nicely, uh, but that's sort of the raw material that diamond is. Uh, just as an example here, something else that shows the structure is the example of quartz. Quartz is actually, we saw it before, it's the molecule SiO2. We did this a little bit with our uh, oxide uh, section. But for quartz here, similarly, although I do write SiO2, the Si is actually bonded to four other oxygen neighbors. Why is it SiO2, though? We had said previously, although I am bonded to, um, sorry, I'm actually drawing this wrong. Uh, although I'm actually bonded to uh, four neighbors in total, because we end up forming a lattice, there are some oxygens that actually just have lone pairs like this, so that on average, it's like every SI only has two neighbors. So I am technically bonded to four, just like I would be uh, in uh, the carbon's case here. Again, it forms that covalent lattice. I would expect this to be solid, uh, pretty hard to break, but that's the other formation that this uh, quartz have, also called silica, used for a lot of uh, sand. So that's one formation for carbon. So back to diamond, tetrahedrally bonded. Second formation here, again, what they ask you is just state a few different allotropes and you want to cite the bonding. We'll go from diamond being sort of super expensive to the really inexpensive here. Let's use graphite. So graphite actually has two different types of bonding. It is also going to be just pure carbon. We actually have sp2 uh, sheets of carbon. So that's already different. Earlier for diamond, it was sp3 tetrahedral, but this time we have a flat uh, paper of carbon, sp2 sheets of carbon. Uh, bond, bonded uh, by London forces uh, in between. 
So you want to be able to specify, if not draw a picture, you want to be able to tell me uh, how things are actually arranged. In this case here, sp2 implies trigonal planar. That means I have a nice paper of carbon. Every single carbon has three other neighbors. I try to use that wedge and dash notation again just to show you the 3D of it. Basically, because we're trigonal planar, we actually have um, we actually have this being nice and flat. So I have a nice flat foil of graphite. Graphite uh, is actually going to be many thousands of layers uh, of carbon. These ones here are sp2 hybridized sheets. Sometimes we refer to them as a trigonal planar array. An array is like a repeating pattern. It's like a whole. It's a whole foil of carbon. We know they're nonpolar overall because it's just carbon fighting against carbon. But because we're in these multiple sheets, what you want to track here is I would be nonpolar. Nonpolar things attach to other things as London forces. So they actually have two different types of bonding here, London forces, and we know this is a very weak force. So what's happening here is along two dimensions, if you took any one of these sheets, you pried at it this way, it's not really easy to melt because the covalent bonds there are really, really solid, right? They're covalent bonds, there's lots of bonding, really hard. And yet the London forces are actually really weak. The force holding one sheet above the other sheet is actually fairly easy to break apart. We actually use this for a pencil lead here. Imagine I have a zoomed in picture. This is my pencil lead. This is just the graphite that's on the edge of my pencil lead. What's actually happening is when you stroke your pencil across a piece of paper, basically what you're leaving behind is you're leaving behind sheets and sheets of graphite every time you make a stroke on the piece of paper. You're actually leaving behind a whole intact sheet. The sheet itself is strong, but separating one sheet and pulling it apart from the other sheet here is not at hard to do. Therefore, what erasers have to do here is erasers have to be more sticky. They have to be able to pull the graphite. The paper is already attracting uh, these graphite labor, uh, layers here. Um, but if the eraser can pull off the graphite, it's more adhesive to the uh, graphite than the paper. That's how you can actually pull your pencil lid off. So hopefully with that, you'll never look at a pencil the same way anymore. All we're doing is we're leaving behind sheets and sheets of graphite. Lately, what they've been able to do is they've been actually able to isolate just a single sheet of graphite. Um, so we have a graphite uh, foil here. If I can just isolate one single layer, we call that one there graphene. So also another sort of allotrope, graphite is many, many layers of graphene. Graphene is just a single layer. There's a lot of uh, curiosity into designing circuits with graphene because graphene is a nice uh, conductive layer. Um, it's a single layer as well. So imagine instead of dealing with wires and soldering and whatnot, we can actually print uh, graphite uh, ink onto a piece of paper. It's already conductive and already you have your circuit. Uh, back to this comment on conductivity here. Back in diamond structure here, we wouldn't expect it to be conductive. For conductivity, as I've been saying many times, for conductivity, you need to have charges. There have to be positives and negatives, and they have to be mobile. In this case here, we have neither. Because we're covalent bonded, sure, I may have the electrons, right? I guess that would be the charges. But it's not like ionic. We don't have the positive and negative. Those charges there are not mobile. Those charges, these electrons are stuck in single bonds. They're stuck in between any two given centers. They're not non-directional bonding. However, compare the case of graphite. For graphite, when we're sp2 hybridized, remember every single carbon actually has a p orbital that's not being used. So if an electron manages to get its way up into the one of those p orbitals here, what would have eventually have been a pi bond, uh, the electrons can actually go around all the tops of these layers, go around all the bottoms of these layers. We refer to that very fancy here. We're going to call that pi delocalization, just like we saw for the benzene molecule earlier. Because electrons in those p orbitals and because they're all parallel, charges can move. So therefore, graphite, this formation, also solid pure carbon. But in this case here, it is going to be conductive. Again, if we know the structure, we can predict something about its uh, overall uh, properties. Uh, let's do two last structures of graphene here. I'm going to link you to a uh, image in the Pearson textbook. It's going to show you some more details of this. But if you imagine taking graphene, one foil of it, one flat sheet of graphite, imagine rolling it into a tube. What do you think a tube made out of carbon is called? Right, so basically, I have sp2 hybridized sheets here. Instead of it being a nice foil here, it's actually rolled like this. This is actually, if you've heard of carbon nanotubes, right, that's actually what it is. One property for nanotubes here is it actually forms a nice molecular catalyst. 
So what would happen here is sometimes out in the environment, it's too dangerous for particles to actually come together. What particles can do is if you have nanotubes in there, particles can actually swim into these nanotubes. They can react inside the cylinder itself, and they can come out, leaving the nanotube un unused. So that's a nice sort of catalytic behavior for nanotubes. The other one that they do in a little more detail here, C, they're given a really funny name. The real name here is a fullerene. But more commonly, these are called buckyballs or Buckminster fullerenes. And essentially, these ones here are actually soccer balls of carbon. Imagine taking that graphene, that one foil, that flat sheet, and imagine forming a soccer ball. Basically, we're going to have a soccer ball. Uh, if you actually look at it, it is going to be planar sort of on the edges. But like a soccer ball here, it sort of needs to wrap itself around. And as it tries to wrap itself around, it ends up um, sort of forming that soccer ball shape. So make a note here for these buckyballs here, we're going to have approximate pentagons and hexagons. So just have another look at a soccer ball. It's exactly that formation of carbon. And the most common ones that we'll see is uh, C60. So carbon with 60, uh, sorry, 60 carbon atoms making up that buckyball. I can have a slightly larger soccer ball here, which is C70. These ones here, although internally the buckyball has 60 carbons, um, actually, I guess I should say the 60 down here. Uh, internally, sorry, 72. Uh, internally, it is a covalent network. There's many, many carbons bonded together. However, the soccer ball itself sort of stays intact. This one here is actually just an individual molecule. How is this one here supposed to hold itself together? It's a London force here between the pauses on this soccer ball and the London forces with the other soccer ball. We have said London forces are relatively weak. Unlike the other ones here, Diamond is solid at room temperature. This one is solid room temperature. This one here should be relatively easy to melt because all you're having to do, again, we're not coming in. We're not breaking the bonds in the soccer ball. We're just separating the London forces, separating these um, individual balls from each other. Unfortunately, because I am going to be in this sort of soccer ball shape here, if I look at those, uh, I know I'm going to be sp2 hybridized. I'm bonded to three other neighbors. If I look at the p orbitals, the p orbitals themselves, first thing is they are sort of farther apart as I sort of wrap around the soccer ball. And because of that, if an electron ends up in one of these p orbitals, it's a little bit harder to actually jump the gap. It's not so easy for electrons to do that delocalization. Because it's further away, these ones here are actually not conductive. So it's because of the geometry, because I have this sort of shape to my soccer ball, it's not so easy to delocalize. Uh, so not conductive there. However, these p orbitals here are places where they can accept other electrons. If I have, let's say, a K with a pos uh, K with an electron currently, uh, I can actually get K to actually donate its electron, just like an ionic bond. Uh, in fact, I can get compounds like I don't know K three C sixty like this. That means I actually have three potassiums having lost their electrons, the C60 has actually become a negative charge. Those electrons had actually been added, even though those electrons can't move one they, once they get added. Uh, there's definitely those P orbitals that can actually uh, take it. This will be a buckyball itself, but overall it's an anion form. So I'm going to link uh, you to uh, the Pearson sort of summary of this one here. They go through some of those main structures. They go through some of the properties. Make sure you know how to describe how things are bonded together. And there's some description of their physical properties. If you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks, guys.